everyone. Welcome uh, to, I guess, this is a mid-afternoon session. Anyway, we are here for the Lightning Talks. Um, and uh, here is our illustrious panel. So um, we're going to just kick it off and just get started, five minutes each. And our first one, um, he's going to be talking about some berries. So here you go, Patricio. Hello. It's a big uh, My name is Patricio González Vivo. Um, and one year ago, I was scraping Google's Street View data, and I was extracting point clouds of it. And I was constructing these landscapes um, that doesn't exist anywhere else except the data. Uh, but it was, this was problematic because this data is private. So luckily, I was very happy to join the Mapsen team in August last year. And since then, I get to know more about OpenStreet Map. And I get to play with the data and do different type of um, um, experiments. This is one from labels. And also to redefine how or push forward the boundaries of how maps can look like, taking some tricks from um, computer graphics world and game engine. Um, but today, actually, I don't want to talk about beautiful maps, even it's a thing that I really enjoy. Um, it's more kind of the opposite. It's about um, slow devices. Um, I think that true openness it means to l means lowering the bar, the technology bar, and to make this more accessible for everybody. Um, so I decided to meet a personal project inside Mapsen with a super slow, inexpensive computer called Raspberry Pi. That probably everybody really knows about Raspberry Pi. Yes, all of you are excited about Raspberry Pi, no? <laughs> I am. Um, it runs a, Linux, a full Linux distribution. It's less than 35 bucks, and it's a project that came up for education. So I thought it would be a really good idea and best to put some open data and open source and make my own, our own GPS, like a DIY GPS device. So I hooked a couple of things together with the Raspberry Pi, a GPS hat. Uh, battery with a charger and a touch screen, which is only a touch screen, one single touch. It's not multi-touch, it's pure chip, three minutes. Um, so I hold this all together with a core of plastic that I 3D print in the office. So yeah, there's a picture of, the, of that. So with it, I managed to make it portable. Whoa. Everybody's thinking that this is going to explode, but it's, I'm not going to say the word with a B because I'm very afraid. There's a guy there watching at me. Okay, um, so the second problem was the interface because it's a only it's a touch only touch device. I have to find some ways around it, so I made two slides to rotate it and to zoom in, and and, and a bottom, and you can see that it works pretty fast, thanks to our brilliant team on the Tangram, ES, Matt and Varun, I think they're there. Okay. Um, so this is, this is working, this is something that you can download, and I'm really hoping that people get excited about this and like start building their own um, devices. I, th I, th I think everybody here enjoys making their own tools. So. Uh, Feel something cool with it, let me know uh, all the information to do it and the schematics to 3D print the case and everything else is in, Git, in our GitHub and, and also it, you can see a nice post about it in our blog post. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Robin Talachko, 
And I'm here to talk to you about how to organize a mapathon, a mapping party, editathon, whatever you want to call it. I'm a grad student at the University of Wisconsin, and I'm currently working with Development Seed. And I wanted to do this talk because when I organized mapping parties in Bogota, Colombia, and Madison, Wisconsin, I could have used a bit more of a roadmap. That said, I'm not going to hand you a mapathon on a silver platter. There's no one right way to do it. However, I am going to be talking about some things that you should consider. You don't need to do all of these things, and there are probably some things I'm missing from this list. Preparing ahead of time. This is important. First, find a co-organizer or two if you can. Uh, this is especially important the day of the event. If you have a lot going on, it's really helpful to have more hands on deck rather than trying to do it all by yourself. Determine your priority. Is your goal to add as much data as possible to the map or to introduce people to OSM? Keep in mind that if you're expecting a lot of new, map, new mappers, that you might want to manage your own expectations about how much exactly is going to be added to the map. Um, that maybe your goal is just introduce people to OSM. Then find a place to hold it. There are all sorts of local uh, organizations or companies that might be willing to host a mapathon. One thing to keep in mind is to check the internet connection of the place where you're going to be hosting it. Um, and also, you might be able to get a local sponsor who can provide some money for things like a happy hour or pizza. Then decide on the format. Are you going to be doing outdoor serving or indoors armchair mapping? Of course, these things aren't mutually exclusive. And if you are doing outdoor serving, I recommend meeting at one central location, introducing LSM, going out doing your serving, and then coming back together at the end to actually begin to add data to the map. Decide what you're going to use and what you're going to, which tools you're going to teach. You may determine this based on your own experience with these different tools and what you feel most comfortable with. That said, you know, now's as good a time as any for you to learn something new. If there's a tool you've been wanting to learn, teaching is the best way to learn that as well. Pick which editor you want to focus on. Of course, people at the event can use whichever one they prefer, but uh, especially if you're expecting a lot of new people, it might be worthwhile to start with ID. It's an easier interface to learn. You don't have to download anything. Though, if you usually use Jossum, you'll want to familiarize yourself with ID as well so that you are there to answer questions. And if you do choose to use Jossum, maybe tell people to download it ahead of time. Outreach. Collaborate with other local groups. And one of the best ways to get the word out is to talk with other groups that are you know, like-minded or doing similar things. Getting out the word. Don't just rely on social media, though that's really awesome. But you can also put up flyers around the city or neighborhood, get on local email lists, uh, get on the OSM wiki. And RSVPing. Of course, you can let people show up at the door. That's great. But if you have an idea of whether you're having five mappers or 55 mappers, that will really help you with planning to know that ahead of time. On the day of the event, give an introduction to OSM. You can decide if you want to do this in one like 10 to 20 minute chunk at the beginning or in three to five minute segments throughout on different facets of OSM. Introduce the tools that you had already decided on. And I would not introduce too many at once. It might overwhelm people. Of course, there are tons out there, but maybe keep it simple. Try and be really welcoming to new people. It can be intimidating to go to an event where you don't know anyone. It's something you've never heard about before. One way to do this is to recruit experienced mappers to come to the event and make sure that they sit next to new mappers. And get mapping. Split up into groups, go out, do your thing, um, and make sure you're available for questions as they come up. Most importantly, have fun. Uh, one of the most important things about a mapathon is getting the word out having, getting other people excited about OpenStreetMap. So you talking about your passion and why you're really excited about OpenStreetMap, that's what's going to be the most helpful for, for OSM. There are a bunch of resources online. Here are just a few. I also, if you look at the Development Seed blog post I just posted, has all of this stuff on there and you can go, you can go take a look. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Kevin. Uh, I work on uh, transportation technology and use OpenStreetMap to do a lot of things to get, help navigate urban environments. And a uh, big interest of mine for a long time with OpenStreetMap has been traffic uh, and traffic speed data. And I want to talk today about a project to uh, start looking at how we can put traffic data onto the OpenStreetMap uh, uh, map base. Uh, first of all, why, is this, why does this matter? Well, fundamentally for uh, transportation applications and, and applications that involve uh, moving through, uh, through, through networks like OpenStreetMap, we really need speed data to be able to do uh, meaningful things with the, data, with, the, with the networks themselves. Without speed data, we can't really meaningfully say uh, how long it takes to get between places or what the best routes between places are. And um, that's really one of the things that's most uh, kind of conspicuously absent from OpenStreetMap in, in a transportation context right now. Uh, and today there's a lot of different places you can get that data, but generally it's their commercial data sets, um, if they exist at all. Uh, they're often uh, cost prohibitive for a lot of applications where people need this data. Um, so next question is, well, the, one of the things to add on to this is actually how, how, actually we're in a moment now at the same time where we also have the ability to produce this data in a lot of the same environments where we need it. We actually have a lot of applications now that are trying to get traffic data, trying to navigate the world. They're actually producing location data and information that couldn't be an input to traffic, uh, to traffic data sets. Uh, GPS data is probably one of the best uh, sources of getting traffic information now that we have billions of devices around the world that are moving through space all the time, collecting GPS data for a variety of reasons, and we can use that to create traffic information. So how do we do this? Um, we're at a point right now where, as I was saying, we have this data. We actually have lots of this data. Um, this is a, a map of, of a, a city in the Philippines, Cebu City, where we've been doing a lot of work, and I'll get to the kind of background on this in a second, where you know, this, is, this is taxi trace data, where, where vehicles are moving through the city and we're collecting GPS information. You can start to see the street network emerge. It's also a really messy thing when you look at it. There's not a lot of information here about how long it takes to get places. There's a lot of data, but not a lot of structured information. So the question is, how do we turn this into traffic information that we can start to use? Well, so it's actually, there's a lot of different pieces of this. This is a diagram that my colleague Kate drew about kind of the process of going from GPS data to traffic data, and this is the, where we are right now in the, in the process of this, of this project. It's actually creating a framework where we can get people who have the traffic, inf who have the, the inputs to traffic information, location data, and get it into a traffic form that we can then aggregate and collect and attach to OpenStreetMap. So the first input to this is shared and open tools that people who have GPS data can work with to actually create uh, derivative information that's actually linked to OpenStreetMap. So we're actually building a set of tools right now as part of this project that are uh, open source that let people, anybody really who has GPS information start to transform that and connect it back to the OpenStreetMap base map and produce these in an anonymized way. Because one of the other really fundamental things here is that a lot of people who have the location data also have uh, really strong concerns about privacy. A lot of times that, that location data came from individuals who are, who are moving around on their own and don't necessarily want that to be made public. But the information about how fast they were able to go down the street, totally okay to make public. One of the big roles of these tools is actually go from private personal information to public information. Second place is actually a place to put it all and actually collect it and aggregate it. One of the, one of the big challenges here is actually start to link this back to OpenStreetMap and connect it there. This is dynamic information. It's changing. It's evolving over time. It's the conditions are changing from day to day. OpenStreetMap doesn't have a great framework for actually putting dynamic data into it, so we need to create a storage infrastructure. But most fundamentally, we actually need uh, collective action. We need get everybody who's working on this to connect together and actually share and coordinate this. Uh, data, so it actually can be the kind of more than the, the sum of the individual parts, because no one alone has enough data to actually build a, a comprehensive map of the world. And this is where we are right now. We're actually building an organization called Open Traffic that's going to sit alongside OpenStreetMap and use OpenStreetMap data and use GPS data that comes in from the locations to actually start to connect this together. This is a consortium of people right now. There's a really large group of organizations and, and, and producers and consumers of this data that are interested in this. So far, just before this is just now something we're talking about publicly and, and kind of getting off the ground. We've already had a chance to, to work really closely with the World Bank over the last couple of years as kind of sponsoring and championing this. Holly Grambeck, who's here, uh, is really the one that inspired a lot of this work and has been able to uh, show the kind of possibility for GPS data around the world as a way to produce traffic. Now we're working with MapZen and, and my company Conveil and, 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 and Mapbox are all kind of getting together and actually looking at ways that we as consumers of this data can, can do this. The question though is actually more about the producers right now. We're creating a framework with open traffic where the producers can get together and actually start to talk about how they can share and contribute data to this alongside. And we'd love to get you involved if you have GPS data or you have an interest in traffic data, reach out. We're also going to be talking uh, in, I think, the 430 Birds of a Feather section, session in room D uh, if you want to come join us and talk more about how this works. Thanks. Hello, 
everyone. Um, my name is Aran Chazen, and I did a project for uh, OSM called uh, Manual Reverse Geocoding with a GIS feature set. And uh, so for OSM, um, I wanted to, to do a project, so I did my town. Um, it's a small town uh, named Piedmont. It's about nine miles east of San Francisco. And I saw a lot of commercial data. So I saw a lot of bu uh, commercial buildings. The footprint was uh, mapped and uh, the address was labeled. But I saw nothing for the uh, residential housing. So for my project, I mapped every uh, footprint of every house. And afterwards, I added the address um, data. Um, and this project is kind of about how I got that, the address data. Uh, so I went to my uh, city hall, I went to the city clerk, and I asked if he, have, if he has any uh, GIS data on the addresses for the city. He said he did, he had a shapefile layer um, of all the data. He gave me his explicit consent to use it. And uh, this is what it looked like. So this is um, just a feature set of the addresses um, at this scale, and when you zoom in, uh, more of the addresses pop up. Um, so I use this, uh, I use QGIS to you for the uh, for the layer, and then uh, by looking at this, I manually added the addresses to OSM. So it was a very tedious uh, project because I do, you know, there's 3,000 uh, addresses here. So it took me a couple of weeks uh, to do this, uh, but when it was done, it was pretty amazing because I had every address in my in my city uh, mapped. So it was a very complete data set. And I, I encourage all of you if, to uh, show this to your peers or to your coworkers who you want to you know, show them OSM. This is a very good uh, place to uh, show them. Um, so when I compare the two, uh, the, top, uh, the top picture is the, uh, uh, the shapefile layer, and the bottom picture is what it looks like in OSM. So you can see every house and every address. It's, it's really cool. Here's just another part of the town uh, zoomed in. Uh, and what I learned from this project, it's quite interesting. Uh, if you see all the houses on the right side of the purple, on the yeah, the right side of the purple line, those are all houses within the city of Piedmont, but they're outside the city boundaries of OSM. And I thought maybe OSM would, might be wrong, but when I looked at other maps, all this is the correct uh, city boundary. So it got me thinking, maybe uh, you know, with OSM, is there some new feature we could uh, have? We can label it. Um, outside the city boundaries, but it's still considered part of the city. The address is still part of the city. And um, no maps have it currently. So maybe it's something uh, OSM can have that's uh, innovative. Um, one also thing I want to uh, tell you guys from this uh, project of mine is if we can create a um, tool in JOSM where you can match the features of in OSM the polygons to a GIS, a GIS layer uh, with the addresses in the correct Latin long, if we can um, um, automatic, instead of manually doing it, have some tool that will do it for me. I believe there isn't one currently. So that's something uh, to think about because if everyone goes to their city government and, and does this, we can you know, map all the addresses pretty easily. I know there's politics involved in terms of governments wanting to give this information out, but uh, my, my uh, city government was, was really cool with it. They were fine with it. So. I assume other governments um, might feel the way, might feel the same. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Oh, okay. And uh, follow me on Twitter. <laughs> Hi, right, thanks for coming out. Uh, I'm going to be t t talking about uh, f f uh, field papers and the work we've been currently doing on it. Um, this is a, st a, st a stutterer's worst nightmare with a guy over there with a with a card telling me how much time I have. But we're, uh, we're under time. oh no, I'll be fine. I just like to throw it out there. Yeah. Um, so for field papers, the, the the image up there right now is um, is 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 all the atlas p pages that have been made in field p p p p papers since it's launched it's around 400 it's over for 400,000 so it's a lot it's yeah anyways um before i get into what we've changed i'm going to just do a brief kind of overview of field papers field papers was created like three or four, four years ago at Stamen by Mike McGursky. 
uh, it, um, and through the help of some other organizations, we've, we've been able to sustain it. Um, it basically allows uh, users to print out multi-page atlases to, to, to take out into the field and um, mark them up, uh, annotate, bring them back into OSM, and put them on a map. Uh, and when things go right, you kind of get things like this happening. Um, whenever we get a good quote, we have to throw it in a slide deck. So uh, Fill Paper is, is, is actually a tool used by a lot of really um, important organizations and NGOs around the world to help create accurate maps of areas that, um, that um, in third world and, and underdeveloped areas of the, of the world. Um, and why, is that, and why is that important? Uh, well, when a natural disasters uh, happen, it's important to have an accurate map to help in the relief. Um, here are some, we, after the earthquake in um, Kathmandu or Nepal, we were able to put up a, f a few other m m m map styles to, um, to kind of help in the situation, uh, one was from Mapbox and the um, the Kathmandu Living Labs, uh, and this one was from Stamen. Uh, also, it's important um, to have accurate maps to kind of uh, understand the human condition or the communities in these areas, um, and with an accurate map, kind of helps to advocate for further needs. So, uh, so f f so field papers is used a lot by these types of organizations. Missing Maps use, uses field papers. Uh, so, tending to field papers. What, we've, uh, what our goal was to simplify, to t take advantage of the newer technology that's come out since it was first developed, and to m make it more u useful internationally. I gotta actually watch this guy. Uh, uh, f yeah, um, so we started to get rid of some things that weren't being used that much, MV tile support, shapefile export, um, pages that um, didn't really kind of work. Uh, one of the biggest things we did was move from PHP to Rails. Uh, uh, that was kind of one of, the, one of our main changes to the app. Uh, we did this one, we did this one to, we, we did it one to make it easier, two is we didn't want to be stewards, we wanted to like own it since the original developers have all left. It was kind of hard to m maintain the library, um, so we kind of wanted to start over. Um, um, and things have been going good. Uh, we're moving along pretty, pretty good. We were able to get translations into field papers, pretty easily. Uh, the login system now actually kind of works. If you lost your password in the old system, you kind of had to create a new user, uh, an account. So that was kind of plus one. Uh, we, Rails allowed us to m migrate the old m models and um, pretty easily. Uh, the two most important f f f features of, f of, of, of field of field papers is the scanning and printing. Uh, we move those into their own, into their own, into their own, into their own, into their own Docker containers. Well, primarily to kind of keep them separated and to it, to uh, to, um, to, um, to 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 trace errors and to um, make them easier to. M allow the community to build on them. What was that say? All right, cool, we're almost done. So we don't get anything. So we're hoping to get rid of these type of emails. Uh, we switched the uh, scanning uh, uh, code to, uh, uh, to OpenCV. Uh, next on the radar, this is my radar image, I love it, uh, is improving the p PDF uh, capabilities. I'll put PDF, I'll put my daughter picked this slide, so it had to go in. Uh, modest maps, we moved away from modest maps in the leaflet, arrows going right. Uh, this is statement. We want help. We love contribution. 
uh, how can you contribute? We move fulfilled papers into its own GitHub uh, uh, organizational page uh, and broke out all the uh, repo parts into their own repos. So contribute code. Uh, there it is. File issues. This is the wrong slide. I sent the. Anyways, it is now actually fieldpapers.org. Uh, help us translate. Only if you know the language. Uh, uh, join us in a conversation. Uh, if you're using it in the field, email us. Tell us what's working, what doesn't work. Invite us along. We would love to come. Uh, um, and this is from. This is. Me asking you for money if you have it, send it our way, and that's it. Set up. Hello, everybody. It's uh, wonderful to see so many friends and um, old colleagues coming back. Um, my name is Thea Aldrich. I've been with OpenStreetMap for quite a while now, and I want to talk to you today about a project that I'm really excited um, to be working with. It's called GeoMakers. And I want to start off by sort of explaining what the concept is. When I first joined OpenStreetMap, there was a huge influence from the successes and the lessons learned from the open source communities. Um, the open source software people very often helped guide those early open street map um, policies, all of those types of things. And what we're seeing now with the rise of the, the popularity in things like distributed sensor networks, the maker movement, the internet of things, is a whole new world of possibilities for geospatially enabled DIY technology has opened up. And what we're talking about is really different types of data that are attached to your location. And when we see the merger of, of these three communities, right, open source software, the open geospatial movement, and the maker movement, we've got all of the key ingredients to an incredibly powerful revolution in the way that people collect, analyze, and make things. Um, Together, these communities have already spurred innovation. You've heard a lot about the use of geospatially enabled technology for things like free speech, civil society empowerment, economic development, small businesses, big businesses, um, disaster response. All of these things have been empowered by the geospatial revolution. And what we want to do with geomakers is say, we're not there yet. There's actually some really big systematic barriers that are going to prevent the, the rapid expansion and scale of a lot of the potential uses for these technologies. Primarily, what's happening is we're not sharing best practices. Across communities, we're seeing the merger of different people. They're getting involved in different verticals that they care very passionately about. But success in one vertical does not necessarily translating into new learning and success in other verticals. And these are having real impacts on the growth of the community. But in addition to the growth of the community, we're also talking about increased cost for deployment of geospatially enabled technologies. We're talking about high contributor attrition rates. Volunteer burnout is a real thing. So opening up some of these communities and reducing some of the barriers that we've seen is going to be key to moving this space forward and really making sure that the benefits of the democratization of the geospatially enabled Internet of Things is actually available to all people. Um, so what is GeoMakers? We're actually a methodology and a platform. We seek to connect, enable, and amplify the use and impact of geospatially enabled technologies. That sounds simple, but what does it mean on a really practical level, right? Because let's face it, this is a complicated area, right? We're talking about new means of production, new means of data sharing and collaboration, but also new uses and, and new markets opening up for this. So GeoMakers as a community is seeking to join together the existing communities that are all working on common goals. We know that together, 
The people in this room in the next five years are going to spur innovation like we haven't seen before, but we don't actually know what that innovation is going to look like. Nobody here knows what the market's going to do, where these things are going, but we do know that if we're going to get there, we have to work together. So GeoMakers connects. Our sole purpose is to connect organizations that are working on shared interests within this realm of making sure that DIY geospatial enabled technology actually gets out into the community and that everyone has access to the means to produce, collect, and distribute their own data. We're also looking to enable the development of new technologies. It's wonderful, some of the work that's being done with Raspberry Pis, with Arduinos, with all of these new maker technologies and new means of production, but it's not there yet. We're also helping organizations deploy and amplify the projects that they're working on. We want a world where everybody has access to this, and the only way we're going to get there is if we work together. So I'd like to encourage you all to join us, join the GeoMaker revolution, become a GeoMaker, start hacking on things, start making your own, and start empowering the people around you by sharing what you're doing in a way that's actually actionable and replicable. Because until we start really attacking some of the barriers that are preventing growth in this system, we're not going to see the true benefits. And so I invite you to join me. Um, thank you. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Todd Bacasto. I'm a product manager with Digital Globe. Um, and I'm here today to talk a little bit about uh, maps in the fight against Ebola um, and Digital Globe's role in supporting some of those activities. So in March of 2014, um, this was the virus that hit West Africa. Um, and it had a profound impact. And so um, many of you are familiar with this story. Um, you can go to uh, this website um, that, with the World Health Organization that provides some of the statistics. And so um, there's been over 15,000 confirmed cases, over 11,000 deaths. So it has significant human toll. Um, and over 10 countries have been affected. So um, the image on the, uh, the, your right-hand side of the screen is a reminder, though, that, that um, this affects people on the ground. And so um, we can map uh, you know, the, the spread of the Ebola virus and a map like this, um, you know, which is available if you go to like the CDC website of the World Health, you can look at how the disease has spread, um, how it's being tracked uh, in the region at scale. So um, in particular, uh, Guinea, Sierra Leone, uh, you can see in this map, have been uh, severely hit. Uh, but it, you know, a map like this helps you at a macro scale to, to narrow the search. Um, but, you know, in order to respond uh, and have an impact on the ground, we obviously need maps um, that are, uh, you know, at the, the town and city level um, so that we can actually put those in the hands of relief workers and begin to coordinate relief activities. Uh, so this is an example um, of a, a town in Guinea, uh, I believe it's pronounced uh, Gekudu. Uh, and um, so in March of 2014, uh, this is what the map looked like on OpenStreetMap. And so um, through the efforts of the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team um, and a variety of um, relief organizations and government organizations, um, the community was able to come together um, to, to begin to, um, to map this area to provide this uh, to workers on the ground. So at Digital Globe, one of the things that we quickly noticed and uh, working with this community we're able to see is that well, when you look at the map that was on OpenStreetMap um, when the virus outbreak started compared to the satellite imagery, there's actually much more that's actually here, right? So this, um, just this quick overlay begins to show us the amount of work um, that needed to be done. And this community uh, really rallied around the cause and was able to uh, very rapidly, within 24 hours, uh, begin to produce um, a more complete map to help enable efforts on the ground. Um, and so this was actually, um, the screenshot was in December of 2014, but really within 20, 24 and 48 hours, really began to see um, really meaningful results. So 
Um, that's a great example and certainly had a significant impact. Um, so what I would submit is that uh, these sort of efforts in OpenStreetMap are really, um, it's not just about making a better map. So um, as we saw with the imagery, uh, that certainly having better data helps enable better maps, um, as well as um, collecting data on the ground. Uh, better maps enable spatial awareness. Uh, better spatial awareness can help enable better decision making. So what else can be done? This image is of a digital surface model. Um, and so recently, a Digital Globe and Saab announced, announced a joint venture uh, called Viacom, which is able to produce digital surface models um, simply by using an algorithm to mine Digital Globe's imagery archive that goes back to 1999. Uh, so we're able to produce this with multiple images at two meter resolution. Um, and you can see this representation as uh, a shaded relief map. Uh, you can zoom in to see the level of detail. Uh, so then when you look at this in the context of satellite imagery, what you see here, um, this is actually uh, satellite imagery as well as we're able to use our uh, cloud-based computing, which is part of our geospatial big data initiative in order to calculate helicopter landing zone areas, which was um, oftentimes used as part of the response, in this case in Monrovia. Um, and then we can layer this um, also with OpenStreetMap to provide additional context uh, so that um, one who may be according these type of activities on the ground um, has additional context and can see where a helicopter could land using the digital surface model combined with points of interest and street-based data. Uh, so after I submitted my abstract for this talk, actually, Nepal happened. So um, we saw many of the same uh, type of, um, uh, of activities in the community really rallying around the response. Um, and so there's a great Wired article that I encourage all of you to read um, that talks about some of the details about that. And so we were able to respond much quicker and have imagery um, out uh, for mapping purposes within 24 hours. And the crowd really began able to, uh, to map this area very rapidly. Uh, so uh, better data, um, better maps, and better spatial awareness, and better decisions, uh, in our mind, really helps have better outcomes for the community. And so if you're looking um, for a way to get involved, I encourage you to um, help map Dar es Salaam uh, tomorrow as part of the, the Hack Day. Um, uh, we are uh, supporting uh, the Missing Maps project for that and provided this um, beautiful Worldview 3 uh, 31 centimeter imagery of Dar es Salaam. Uh, so come out and join us and we look forward to um, getting your help. Thanks. Um, hey ho, everybody. Uh, my name is Lisa, and I'd like to show you a project of mine which I call Walking from Manhattan to Hong Kong. So that's Manhattan. We are where the red rectangle is, and we will come to Hong Kong a little bit later. So what am I doing? I'm actually visualizing data. So I'm not working with map data so often, but more like with normal numbers. And when I've learned something in the last few months of doing that, then that normal numbers are pretty lame. They don't tell you anything. They don't tell you anything if you don't set them in the context. So you don't want to just show your number. You actually want to compare it, for example, with the values of similar objects, like your competitors. Or you want to compare it uh, with um, the situation in the last 10 years, or with the situation in the last 10 years of your competitors. And you can also compare it with the situation in other locations, of course. And you can't only do that with normal numbers, but also with map data. So that's a graphic that compares the size of the Yosemite Rim Fire a few years ago with the size of Berlin. And this one compares the size of Russia with the size of the US. And of course, there are some tools out there which let you compare everything with everything. So here it shows to compare the size and shape of Germany with the size and shape of the New York State. Um, so this is not a new concept. Here we have a pretty old um, graph comparing the length of rivers with each other. Here even sorted by continents. Um, this is comparing the heights of mountains. And this is comparing the size and shapes of islands. And I saw that and thought, hmm, that's, that's pretty cool. I can do that. 
I can take OpenStreetMap data and compare the size and shape of Hong Kong, for example, with the one of Manhattan. And I can see, wow, Manhattan is smaller than Hong Kong. That's interesting. Um, but I thought, hmm, that's maybe not enough. Why not, why not trigger the creativity of my readers and viewers a little bit? Why not connect these islands with each other? So that's what I did. Um, and with connecting these cities, these city islands with each other, I also connected um, the comparison I was talking about with a new layer, the imagination of my viewer. Um, I wanted to bring these two worlds together, comparison and imagination. And I also wanted to bring the world, our world together, quite literally. So I took um, some islands on which we can find cities like Manhattan in the middle, um, Hong Kong to the top, um, to the left is Singapore and Miami Beach, and to the right is Montreal, Staten Island, and then Venice. And I put them on a map together. Um, you can still have the comparison. You can still see Manhattan is tiny and Montreal is huge. Uh, but you can also have this nice Im imagination aspect. So you can imagine to walk from Montreal to Palm Island, in, which is actually in Dubai. Um, you can imagine to see Manhattan not uh, from Staten Island or New Jersey or Brooklyn, but from Hong Kong, from Montreal, and from Singapore. And for me, it was really important that I'm actually playing around with real places that actually exist in the world. I use them like Lego bricks, um, because only if you use these existing places, you can actually trigger new thoughts um, about the current world. So just, just imagine, for example, um, the continents of Africa and Europe being switched, or imagine the Chinese wall being in Australia, or imagine, um, I don't know, the, the Iraq being um, an island um, off the coast of the east coast of like, the US or so. It automatically triggers um, thoughts about social um, um, differences, about culture, about history about um, consequences, too, of these places. So, um, yeah, that's, that's the power of fiction. That's something that comparison itself can't offer you. Um, I want to leave you with the thought, actually, that the world, of course, gets represented by maps. That's why we built OpenStreetMap, right? To build like a representation of our world. Um, so if you change the representation, you can also change um, the thoughts about our world. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Garvin. I'm here to tell you about Mozilla Location Service. This is an open service for network geolocation. And it's open in the sense that it's open source. The Cellular data is free to download. It's free to use. The Wi-Fi data, unfortunately, is not due to privacy reasons, and I'll talk about that a bit more at the end. Um, and a network location service is where a device scans the Wi-Fi and cell networks around itself, bundles those up, sends them to a web service, and the web service sends back a location. Um, it's like a thumbprint that somebody's been there before and they saw these radio signals around them. Let me explain the difference between network and GPS geolocation. GPS is, is slow, it's very accurate, and requires a lot of power on the device. Network geolocation, on the other hand, is all the opposite uh, features. It's fast, it's low power, it's more approximate, but it requires an internet connection. So why is Mozilla interested in geolocation? Well, geolocation is an HTML5 standard, so all web browsers any web page can ask for a location, and a web browser is expected to respond. And if you want people to use your web browser, <laughs> you'd better respond to that. Also, Mozilla has a um, mobile operating system called Firefox OS. And as part of a, a good experience on a mobile device, for a good geolocation experience, you would want to have both GPS and network geolocation for those fast, low-power lookups. For example, for single-shot lookups, you're often getting a network location. And then if you're doing a navigation app, you're probably getting, almost certainly you're getting your GPS. Some of the uh, devices actually, that uh, the Firefox OS devices have gone out, have no GPS on them. And they completely use network geolocation. So 
to do this, um, we were using commercial providers. And due to restrictions, various reasons, it hasn't really worked out very well. So the idea was we would try to go on our own. We would try to collect all the world's cell tower and Wi-Fi networks and create our own service. Easy peasy. And we would do this with very little staff and rely on the kindness of others to collect the data for us and, and crowdsource it. Well, I'll skip ahead. It's actually worked out. So we've been collecting data mainly through two means. We have Mozilla Stumbler for Android, which is a, a standalone aggressive data collection, Wi-Fi and cell networks. And when you install Firefox or Android, you get a pop-up that asks, would you like to contribute your location to our service? And a lot of people do check it off. Goodness, thank, thank you to them. And um, that's very, very low power, um, sparse contribution. We also um, work with uh, OpenCell ID and a few other um, open data platforms. So how are we doing? Well, here's our, kind of shows up. Uh, there's our coverage map. We have a good chunk of the world covered. Uh, if we zoom in on New York, we'll get an idea of what a fully covered, maybe you won't, because you can't see blue on black, but what we would have there is the blue fuzz is all the areas of contribution that we would have for, for, for this area. And um, anywhere within there, you would expect to get very good geolocation from our service. I, I'm not a cartographer. I would have done a better job. Um, in terms of numbers, it's probably aren't hugely meaningful, but this is what we have currently. We estimate if we have about two or three times this amount, we are comparable to commercial services. And if our curve keeps going up, we should get there. So one of the reasons I'm talking is not just tell you what we're doing, but um, we really want to encourage uh, contribution and to get some more interest in the service. We want to encourage people to use the service for your own projects, for, for products even. Um, we are interested in how our data could be used for mapping purposes. We're mainly focused on geolocation within the team, but we have huge streams of data coming into the service. We have large volumes of data, our, our cell database, and I wouldn't be surprised if somebody here has some ideas about how that could be used for mapping purposes. Um, and there are some other projects that are, that are using, using our data. Um, the other thing is um, how we can expose our Wi-Fi data. So currently, that's the only closed part of the system is the Wi-Fi data due to privacy reasons. We believe there is a way, we don't know how, to expose this data for uh, geolocation and for mapping purposes. One of the things you could do if you could get the Wi-Fi data out of our system and put it on a device is you could have fully offline geolocation. So if anyone has ideas about how to do that, please talk to us. We're desperate. So uh, that's it. That's our contact information. I'm Garvin Keeley. I'm here with Victor Ng. Here's links to the service. Um, and there you find links to the GitHub code and everything else. If uh, this interests you, please let us know and talk to us further. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. And thanks for keeping the five minutes. Um, we can continue the conversation afterwards. And, and next, we'll have the next session. Thanks. Uh, and apparently I'm making an announcement. <laughs>